soothing. Today's scripture is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. The parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. Raise your hand if you've seen those new orange little scooters floating around Wichita. Now raise your hand if you've actually tried one of them out and ridden them. Just me and Gabe. <laughs> I actually dipped my toe in the waters of that this week, and early in the week, I uh, walked down to the coffee shop and brought up the little app and figured it out and figured out how to rent one of those, and, and I took it for a spin. I, I drove over to my house, which isn't too far from here, but then I also kind of took it on a little bit longer of a trip. I went all the way up to 21st and Amidon uh, on the bike path up there, which who knows if that's legal or not. But anyways, <clears throat> I made it up there and came all the way back on a pretty substantial, uh, on a substantial trip with the thing. And I've got to say, I kind of get their appeal. It was a fun little trip. There are a lot of fun to zip around on. Although, that being said, uh, I am getting to be an old man, and I have some very particular thoughts about whether or not you should wear a helmet with them and whether you should drive them in traffic or not, but that's a whole other conversation. Overall, they were a lot of fun, and it was kind of a fun way uh, to start the week. Somewhere around that time, early in the week, I also wound up having, int having an interesting conversation with a homeless man in our neighborhood. We got to talking about a lot of different things, and it eventually came up that he actually had a job on the south side of town that he needed to be at, except he didn't really have any way to get there uh, down to the south side, and he didn't have bus fare or any other transportation. And so after talking with him for a little while, I offered to take him where he needed to go. And so I drove him to the south side of town, where he eventually spent the night on a couple of pallets behind a hardware store. As we were driving through town and talking a little bit, I did ask him, well, so if you've got a job down south, wh why are you all the way up here in our neighborhood? And he said, well, you know, the job doesn't last but a couple hours in the morning. And all of the homeless services in Wichita are basically downtown. So even if he worked for a couple of hours, he had to get back up here for lunch. At some point in the middle of these two experiences, I had a conversation with someone else where we were talking about these little orange scooters and how they were being used and who was using them. And in the conversation, this other person made the comment that for a lot of people, the scooters are just fun. But for a certain segment of people, well, they could actually be a necessary mode of transportation in our city that would meet a very critical need. In fact, the more I thought about it, <clears throat> it struck me that for the person that I took across town, the scooters would actually be a perfect mode of transportation that would meet a key need. But as we talked, we also realized that actually in order to use the scooters, you have to also have a smartphone and you have to have a credit card or a debit card in order to be able to pay for those things, which those are really hard to come by for low-income people. Which meant that the ultimate irony of these scooters is that for the vast majority of people like me, they're a toy, they're a luxury, they're a thing to play around with. But for the people who actually could use them for a real transportation need, 
Well, they're actually still out of, use, out of reach, and they can't use them. I've been thinking about these couple of experiences this week a lot, particularly in relation to the scripture for this morning, uh, which deals with greed and wealth in general. And in some ways, the temptation to think about greed is, is to think of it as something that, well, is this big sinister thing, greedy thing to identify. That's easy to identify. In some ways, we want to say, well, look at those big, bad, greedy people over there who more often than not conveniently don't look like me, right? But the thing is, the thing that I've been thinking about this week is that actually wealth and greed is a lot more sneaky than that. It's an incremental change over time. It's something that creeps up on us. What's more, we can wind up justifying all manner of things simply because, well, the other people in my neighborhood they're, or my peer group, they're already doing these other same kinds of things, so it doesn't feel like I'm really being that greedy. In fact, I might not even feel particularly wealthy because I've got friends who, well, they have all these other things that I don't have and I can't afford. I mean, riding around on a scooter, quite frankly, doesn't feel greedy or even like a luxury at all to me when I know that I have spent more on a cup of coffee than I did on that scooter ride. And yet, when you kind of look at the whole big picture, in the social context, we may get a different picture. This is something that I think we can find in our scriptures for this morning. We can find them in a lot of different scriptures, actually. One of the other lectionary scriptures, which we didn't read this morning, is actually from the letter to the Colossians from, from the Apostle Paul. And in that letter, Paul is ta- telling them, them uh, a number of different things on how they should live, but also things that they should not do. And one of the striking things in that scripture is that Paul has a list of different things, the last of which he says is greed, and then in parentheses it says, which is idolatry. When he singles out greed specifically as being idolatry, it sort of feels like a next level kind of thing. We've got to remember that in the Jewish faith, which is where Paul was coming out of, one of the core things about the Jewish understanding is that we worship God alone. We worship Yahweh alone. We do not worship other gods alongside of that. In the Ten Commandments, we have one of the big ones that says, you shall have no other gods before me. Which means... Anytime the Bible names something as an idol explicitly, that's not just saying this is something that you shouldn't do, but rather it's it's saying that whatever this is, is something that is making a claim over people's lives in the same way that God is doing. It's a bigger deal. It's something that is in competition competition with God for people's allegiance and worship and loyalty and trust and so on. And there's a lot of things that we could name as being idolatrous or or taking on facets of that, but there aren't a lot of things that really get named as an idol, particularly by Jesus. But, But money and greed are one of them. In fact, the Gospel of Luke gets pretty clear about the way that money and greed are in competition with God. The different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's four different versions of the story of Jesus, and they all have a different take on the story of Jesus. And the Gospel of Luke is by far the most, let's say, social justice-y version of the Gospel story. And we can see that in a number of different places, particularly when we compare them. For starters, let's look at the Beatitudes. There's a version in the Gospel of Matthew and the version in the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Whereas in Luke, he just says, blessed are the poor. In Matthew, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But in Luke, it is, no, blessed are those who are hungry now. On top of that, Luke adds a whole section to the Beatitudes that isn't in the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew, you have all the blessings, which you have versions of those in the Gospel of Luke. But then in Luke, Jesus goes on to add a section of woes or warnings. He says, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. 
on top of all of this in Luke 14, 33, which we'll talk about in several weeks from now. But, but Jesus, there's this section where Jesus is talking about counting the cost of discipleship. Basically, you need to know that following Jesus will be difficult and you will have to sacrifice things. And he ends that particular section of scripture by saying, so therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. In Luke chapter 16, a little bit later, Jesus tells a parable where he actually tells people that they should use money dishonestly, meaning in that parable that they should give it away to their, and make friends with people so that they can secure a heavenly home and not an earthly one. And why does Jesus tell people to do this? Well, he ends that parable by saying, because you cannot serve both God and money. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is awfully clear about some of these things. Now, there are other times when I've preached about this or talked about this that I've had people come back and say to me, well, hey, Alan, let's remember here that it's not, the, it's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. It's a heart thing, right? Which is true. That's what 1 Timothy 6 says. That's what Paul says. But I would be careful in that thinking. I would remind us to be on guard that we don't use that as a way to actually justify ourselves and our own wealth. Because I think when we read Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus might actually come back to us and say, no, actually having wealth and money itself can be a problem. Jesus might tell us that money in and of itself has a power that can corrupt us without us even knowing it. And I think that's where the subtlety of the idolatry of greed plays into this. When we read all of these different scriptures, we can see Jesus and other biblical authors writing about greed and money in very strong and forceful terms. But I think it's this parable from our scripture from Luke today that shows us how sneaky this can really be. Although before we get to that, I want to say a little bit more about what I mean when I say that money can be an idol. In, Colossian, in the Colossian scripture, Paul talks about greed being an idol, which sounds striking, but we need to remember what an idol is. An idol essentially is something or someone that is claiming to take the place of God. Well, then we can ask, what is the function of God? Or maybe even let's broaden it. In the scope of world religions, what does a God do? Well, a God functions as something or someone that provides us with things like a sense of meaning or identity as human beings. We know who we are by comparing ourselves to God. A God is something where we place our allegiance as individuals and as a group. We all give our allegiance to this, whatever that is, <clears throat> whatever that might be. Which, by the way, another word for allegiance to someone or something is just the word worship. Worship and allegiance are closely tied together and doing the same thing. A god is also usually a source of order and a source of rules for living our lives as individuals and as groups of people. A god even defines our sense of morality. Perhaps most importantly, a god is also what we turn to in times of trouble. A god is where we put our hope and our sense of trust when times are bad, when things turn south in our life, whatever we turn to for our sense of security, our sense of safety, whatever we turn to to provide for our basic needs, that is the person or thing that is functioning as a God. A God also demands sacrifice of some sort. We give something of ourselves to God in return for that security or hope or trust or whatever it is. An idol, then, is anything that is not God, or more specifically in our context, that is not our God, that is not Jesus, but yet tries to take the place or functions of God. 
Anything that asks us to pledge our allegiance to it instead of God. Anything that claims to be our guide for morality or justice. Anything that tries to make a claim over our lives in terms of our identity or value or worth as a human being. Anything that claims to give us security or protection. Anything that demands a sacrifice from us. Anything that asks us to put our ultimate trust and hope in it. Anything that tries to make us, en- make us any of these promises or claims over our lives is an idol. Because ultimately, all of that is stuff that belongs to Jesus and not to anything else in this world. And to be clear, there are many, many, many things and people even who make some of these idolatrous claims over our lives. Things like sports or politics or politicians or guns or nationalism or even religion itself can claim any one of these functions in our life that really belongs to God. I also hope that you're beginning to see, however, why Jesus talks about greed and money in a bit of a different way, though. Because when we talk about the force that money has in our lives, Money does not just try and take the place of some of the things that God does, but rather money tries to take the place of God in all of these areas. Money is a force that places a claim on our lives in ways that almost nothing else does. It demands our allegiance and our worship, even even in ways we might not realize. It guides our decisions about what we think is just or moral, and it will even cause us to do things that are against what we would otherwise say are just or moral. It quite literally quantifies the identity, the value of a human being. When we put a dollar amount on the hours of our lives, money tells us that some people's lives are literally worth more than others. It's what we turn to for our basic needs and our sense of security, and our provision for life in this world. Money invites us to put our ultimate hope and trust in it rather than God. It even demands sacrifices, sacrificing our very life, our families, our health, in order to get more of it. This is why Jesus tells us that money, or speaks of money as being an idol. Because money is not a neutral force. It makes claims over our lives that should belong to God alone. Even more sinister, the power that money can have over us creeps up without us even knowing. Particularly when we're talking about the process of putting our trust and our hope in something, uh, whether it be money or anything else, that doesn't happen overnight. In the parable that Jesus tells about the rich man deciding to build more barns, I think it's worth noting that it doesn't necessarily start off with the man setting out to be greedy. The man was simply doing what he knew how to do. He'd been running this farm, this business for a long time, and he'd done it in a successful way. He starts out a rich man in this story. And now he's got this farm that all of a sudden produced more than what he knew what to do with. Produced more than what he set out to make. And here he's found himself with far more than he needs, maybe even just by working hard and running a successful business, all of which we might look at as being admirable and even godly. And I'm not saying that it wasn't. But then he makes a decision. He makes a decision of what to do with that abundance. He makes a decision to hang on to it for himself. More importantly, he decides to retire early because now, because he has now put his trust in that wealth that he has managed to accumulate for himself. But of course, what he doesn't know in the parable is that even though he tries to keep that wealth for himself and rely on that, well, he's not run out of money, but he's run out of time. Which I think this is when Jesus' earlier warning earlier in the story comes into full focus. It's, a, it's the point of this whole scene comes fairly early on. And it's the point not just for the man who's asking him to divide up the inheritance, but also probably for us as well. 
This man comes to Jesus, asking him to divide up his parents' inheritance because, well, he and his brother can't get along and are fighting over it. And in response to that, Jesus tells him, be on guard. One's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. It's not about the stuff you have that makes your life or even the wealth that you have. In light of the parable that Jesus tells after this, maybe we could take the well-known saying as the lesson that Jesus is really trying to get across, which is when life gives you more resources than you need, don't build a bigger barn. Build a bigger table and invite more in. See, the thing about putting our trust in money is that it doesn't start out at the point where we sacrifice our relationships with our family to get a piece of that inheritance. Well, no, it, it starts out long before that. It's incremental. We, we gain a bit more access to a little bit more money, which affords, uh, affords us a little nicer car or a little nicer house, or in my case, a little nicer table saw, or whatever it might be. And then, over time, what happens is we become used to that new standard of wealth. And actually, we can even start to feel a bit more entitled to having it. And more importantly, we begin to rely on that wealth. Eventually, we follow the path. We can follow the path to the point where building a bigger barn and hoarding wealth far beyond our actual needs, well, all of a sudden, that seems like the logical and prudent thing to do. I mean, one of the things that is so sneaky about the power of money and wealth is that there are times when greed can actually twist us around to the point where it seems like it's the responsible thing to do. And so what's the message for us? Is it the message that Jesus says? In order to follow him, we have to go sell all, sell all of our possessions? Should we take all the money that we have out of the bank and go down to Broadway and just start handing it out to everybody who's on the street? Well, it's at least a little biblical. But I will leave that up to your conscience and the direction of the Holy Spirit. At the very least, however, I think there's something more important that we need to pay attention to here. I think we should heed Jesus' warning about the power of wealth in our lives. We should be very careful about where we put our trust and our hope at the end of the day. And we need to be on guard to that power that just creeps up on us. We must remember that life, as it says on the front of the bulletin, life is not made up of the things that we own. And ultimately, maybe the most important thing here is that we need to make sure that our lives do not exist to accumulate more wealth, but rather that whatever wealth we have been given by God exists to, to, exist to serve the pursuit of life. And not only our own, but also the lives of others around us who are in need. Or as Jesus said it far better than I ever will, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. Because where your treasure is, that is where your heart will also be. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from the First Church of the Brethren in Wichita, Kansas. If you'd like to watch another video, click the link on the right. Thanks for liking, commenting, and subscribing on this video. And we'd love to have you join us on Sundays at 9.30 for Sunday school and 10.45 for worship. Everyone is welcome and you're invited.